the 27th World Climate Change Conference in Egypt and provide you with the most important information of the day, the latest developments and voices from the field. We start with a first contribution on the topic of the day. Hello, I am your colleague Hassan Mohammed. I am climate and environmental activist from Sudan. I started Fridays for Future in Sudan since 2019. I'm sending greetings to all of the great people who are watching this video. I have three messages to share with this video. The first message will be about the climate crisis situation in the African and Arabian region, which is my region. And also, the second will be about the climate situation in my country, Sudan which is one of the most affected countries by the climate crisis. And also the third message will be about the Conference of Parties, which will be in Egypt on November. Firstly, when we talk about the climate crisis, we are talking about something which is really risky for our lives as human beings. This is existential threat, existential danger for the humanity. And when we talk about the climate crisis, we need to describe it as it is fact. It is this. It is crisis. It's not phenomena. And sadly, most of the media are trying to say this is just a phenomena. And this is really not good. This is misleading points. We need to ask them to change this. In Africa, as it is a part of the most affected countries, we are facing devastating floods, desertification, drought, problems in the water, high temperatures, also problems with agriculture, with all the consequences of the climate crisis. And this is not something in the future. This is something we are facing it directly as a daily situation. In my country, Sudan, we are facing all of these problems also. And the most important problem is the agricultural field problem because the agricultural problem in Sudan means problem for most, uh, mm -hmm. the, most of the population, about 60% of the population depend on agriculture. So problem in, agric in agriculture means food crisis and also security crisis because all of the people in the countryside will start making clash over the pastures. Also, I want to say in this video, we need to ask all the leaders and the decision makers to change their mentalities and try to make effective and practical uh, ways to solve the problem, not just making dead speeches. And this what I hope to see, to see in the upcoming conference in Egypt. And I am, I hope, I hope they will be changed in this conference. And I hope this conference will lead to to make difference. But as I all, as we all believe. The conference of parties are not the solution, but at least we can find a way of representing our crisis with them. I would like to end this video saying the only way that we will stick to it to, to achieve the climate justice is struggling for it, because struggling is a matter of life. After this brief overview, we can now dive deeper into the COP. The following article is on what happened today. The first week of COP is slowly coming to an end. After technical negotiations in the last days, ministers will arrive tomorrow and be brought up to date. 
Meanwhile, the Egyptian COP presidency will start consultation on a COP cover decision highlighting the main outcomes of the conference. Today was dedicated to decarbonization. Alarmingly, the fossil industry took the stage at many side events. The Canadian Pavilion hosted the company Suncor and Imperial Oil this morning, who represent 95% of Canada's oil sands production. Many discussions revolved around carbon removals, geoengineering and gas as an alleged bridge technology for green hydrogen. False solutions, according to civil society commenters. Negotiations ran late into the night on Thursday. With parties still expressing concerns and divergence on many issues, time is running out to agree on decision texts to report back to the chair of the UNFCCC subsidiary bodies until tomorrow. Concerning the hot topic of loss and damage, slow progress has been made in operationalizing the Santiago Network, an institutional body to facilitate technical assistance and capacity building regarding loss and damage. The first of negotiations about a funding arrangement are more gridlocked. While the negotiations group of G77 plus China continues to call for a new loss and damage finance facility, developed countries want to focus on strengthening existing institutions, particularly outside the UNFCCC. At least there seems to be a consensus that assessing the gaps in addressing loss and damage will be an important part of the global stock take. The global stock take will assess the progress towards goals of the Paris Agreement in 2023 and will be the focus of COP28. While the rich countries seem to be happy with such a procedural outcome, the G77 are united in pushing for concrete outcomes at this COP. Meanwhile, the world is lagging behind on mitigation pathways. Last year, all countries agreed on submitting a new and more ambitious NDC until 2022. NDCs are the nationally determined contributions to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. It became rather clear that the current targets, if realized, would likely only lead to a 2.4 to 2.7 degree pathway, far away from necessary 1.5. Until today, only 30 new NDCs were submitted, according to the Climate Action Tracker. More than 160 countries did not update their NDCs at all, including big emitters like the United States, Japan and the European Union. Instead, the European Parliament just voted for a plan to repower the EU that allows practically any fossil fuel investment under the guise of guaranteeing the short-term security of supply, says the Climate Action Network. Energy security can only be achieved with renewables. A way forward could be just energy transition partnerships, short jet piece. They are fast-track projects for the decarbonization of developing economies with the help of industrialized economies. The first one with South Africa was established at last year's COP. New partnerships with Vietnam and Indonesia are expected to be announced until the end of the year. The negotiations for a new mitigation program have begun. Key issues are the timeline, whether to aim for sectoral decarbonization and to agree on concrete policy outcomes, such as a coal phase-out. The proposed solutions seem to center around two poles, supported by different interests and party groups, either a minimalist plan or a robust 10-year program. It is unlikely this will get resolved this week, but options need to be refined to pass on to the ministers next week. Lastly, women in long striking blue dresses have been appearing at COP. They are part of the Flood the COP campaign, signaling the flood is coming. Finally, we have some important youth news for you. During yesterday's high-level opening of Youth and Future Generations Day, the youth constituency, Yango, handed over the Global Youth Statement to UNFCCC Secretary Simon Steele. The statement is subtitled Declaration for Climate Justice and contains key demands around all big negotiation points. It is the result of consultation with youth online and of countless local conferences of the youth all around the globe. Way to go, youth! We have already learned a lot about the COP. We now switch to our editorial team on site, which is coming up with an exciting interview. Dear editors, who have you brought in with you this time? So my name is Charlene Mersai. I'm the National Environment Coordinator for the Republic of Palau. Um, I've been following COPS for some time now, but uh, this is my first year really focusing on negotiations, uh, and so I'm still learning. Yes. We all do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, 
what is the global goal of adaptation? The GGA, as we call it, is basically um, our efforts, collective effort to be able to monitor what are we doing with adaptation. We talk about adaptation all the time, um, but how do we know we're really achieving, you know, building resilience and reducing vulnerability? So this is hopefully will help us kind of figure out ways to monitor our progress. Um, what's interesting is that for the first year, it seems like dialogue has been focused on process. We're hoping to turn that narrative around and bring back the conversation to say exactly what do we want to achieve so that when we decide on our indicators, we know we are meeting that particular collective target. Um, right now, there's 195 countries. Probably each of us have a different idea of what our, our deadline is or our end goal is. And we need to first have an agreement on what that target is and then talk about process. Um, so for EOSIS, where my government is involved in, um, we would like to identify that sort of framework. What is the ultimate goal? What is the structure? And then I discuss the, the processes and the specific indicators. So that's kind of the first point that we'd like to hone in. The second point is to really clarify that if you really want to measure adaptation progress, it's not enough to discuss it at the global level. You got to bring it down to the local community, which means there has to be a national level as well. So multi-level ways to monitor progress. Uh, and of course, we got to bring in the indigenous uh, culture, the, of course, gender, because it's not bringing back to like really community-based uh, adaptation focus. That's very challenging. We're hoping that we'll have some kind of an agreement by the end of this week so that next week we can start kind of developing how we can actually move forward rather than just kind of discussing where we left off at the last COP. Yes. Mm. So you already mentioned some challenges. Yes. Can you um, say what are the key problems at the negotiations? I think really the first key problem is it's very short time. Um, this sort of dialogue began last uh, last year. Not all parties were involved in the first year of dialogue, like my government wasn't even involved. So this is kind of our entry into this discussion. And so I think the short time frame, not everyone was engaged in the beginning. So some of us are ahead of the game, some are just kind of figuring out what's going on. Uh, but we all need to come up with some kind of decision by the end of this COP in order to have collective agreement on well, how to move forward before the next COP. So I think that's really the major challenge. It's not enough time, not enough uh, participation, uh, and the pressure, yeah. Okay. And what are your core demands for um, the global goal of adaptation for this COP? I think right now the core demand that hasn't been addressed is whether we will collectively agree on that framework. There's probably different definitions or understanding of what that is. Some parties feel like we don't need to spend time discussing that. We already know enough. Let's dive into the process and get down to the nitty gritty, the technical stuff. Some of us are saying, wait a minute. Uh, if you talk about process, for example, specific indicators in our countries do not even have enough indicators. We're gonna be left out in the discussion. Um, so we want to make sure that let's all agree on where we're going and then decide on the how. We, we're not ready to start discussing the how. So that would be our, our sort of aspiration uh, to convince our fellow parties to help us take a step back if that's how they feel because we're not there yet and all start on one uh, platform together before moving forward. Yeah. Thank you very much. You see, that's really something else when you hear something like this directly from the ground. We want to continue with this and pass the microphone on to activists on the ground. Hi, I am Saini and I am coming from the Gambia in the Atlantic, um, from West Africa. And I am coming from a country where little is known about and many people do not know the threat that we face in terms of the climate crisis. My country is very vulnerable to rising sea levels and there are projections that the city will be underwater by the end of the century. And we depend heavily on agriculture and tourism as the main um, economic growth of the country. So agriculture contributes a lot 
to the economy and I myself being an agricultural science student at university I don't want to see rising sea level taking over arable lands is going to cause massive hunger in my country so that's why I feel like COP27 is something that um, can address this kind of crisis and make sure that they respond to these countries that are being threatened with rising sea levels, rising temperatures, and most especially climate refugees. Because I know if my city is underwater, many people will become climate refugees. There will be movement inland. And also there is little awareness that um, going on around the threat of rising sea levels in my capital city and basically headline news does not cover it because we are the smallest country on Africa mainland and I would say little is known about the country because though it's a stable country but we are facing such a threat and these are one of our major concerns that we want it we want global leaders to hear and to make sure that they act accordingly um, yeah it's okay. Tomorrow, the thematic day for adaptation in agriculture is coming up. Moreover, we will hear the closing statements of the subsidiary bodies tomorrow, before the negotiations continue next week, with more high-level segments hopefully reaching concrete conclusions. COP will not take a break, but we will. We welcome you back on Tuesday with Climate Youth News at COP. See you there.